Well, I hope uh, you all have uh, enjoyed this uh, excellent meal. And uh, I think we will uh, go ahead and start with our program. And I think uh, we have a very, uh, very interesting speaker here with us this evening. We're very fortunate to have him. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. William Fitzgibbons, Dean of uh, the College of Technology at the University of Houston, who will uh, introduce our guest. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, deeply honored uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Dinesh Singh. Dr. Dinesh Singh is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Delhi. For the, those of you who are not familiar with the Indian or the UK educational system, uh, for that matter, uh, the Vice Chancellor is what we would call uh, in Texas, Chancellor. Uh, the Chancellor of the University of Delhi is the President of India. Uh, as a, a Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, Dr. Singh uh, holds ministerial rank and is a member of uh, the Indian Cabinet. Dr. Singh is internationally acclaimed as an educator. In this year alone, he has received uh, four honorary doctorates uh, from the, the University of Edinburgh, the National Institute uh, of Technology in Kurok Setra, uh, India, University College Cork, and uh, the University of Houston. By training, Dr. Singh uh, um, is a mathematician. He earned a, an honors BA from St. Stephen's College um, uh, in India. He also earned uh, a Master of Arts and a Master of Philosophy for, uh, from St. Stephen's. Uh, uh, he, he earned his PhD from Imperial College uh, uh, of Science, Technology, and Medicine in London. In addition, <coughs> in addition to his scientific work, uh, Dr. Singh is a humanist, a student of Gandhian philosophy, fluent in Sanskrit, and an accomplished painter who's had exhibitions in several prominent Indian uh, venues. Dr. Singh is uh, deeply uh, connected uh, to Houston, NASA, and the University of Houston. For, I guess, at least 30 years, he's been a, 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 a frequent uh, uh, a visitor to, uh, to the city. His brother, sister, sister-in-law, and late brother-in-law have all worked with the NASA effort. As Vice Chancellor uh, of the University of Delhi, uh, Dr. Singh uh, heads an entity spread across two campuses enrolling close to half a million students, comprised of 14 faculties, uh, 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 86 academic departments, and 80 colleges. This enrollment by far exceeds the totality of the enrollments of the University of Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, and the University of Houston system. As Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, India has a population uh, I th that it's approaching uh, 1.4 billion. 
Over half of this population is under the age of 25. The unit of what happens in higher education in India is going to have a major impact on the world. Uh, the University of Delhi is recognized as uh, the preeminent uh, university of India, and it is the National University of India. Dr. Singh is uh, overseeing and directing uh, transformational change at the University of in, uh, India. Um, his work will have uh, lasting influence. And, and, and that being said, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce my dear fr friend, Dr. Dinesh Singh. Dr. Singh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be present here today and to have been given this opportunity to speak my mind before you. As any married man knows, Opportunities to speak one's mind are rare and far between. And a captive audience like this is going to allow me to have my say. <laughs> I have been closely connected with Houston as Professor Fitzgibbon just mentioned. Fitz and I are dear friends. He's like an elder brother. Much of what I have been able to do in my mathematical work and some of my best work has happened in collaboration with mathematicians at Houston or otherwise can be significantly traced to Fitz. And thank you for saying all those nice things about me, Fitz. My father would have loved to hear them, but only my mother would have believed them. <laughs> I have chosen the topic, empowering nations through science and technology and education in these realms, through the example of India. And I have a story to tell. I'm no historian, I'm no economist, I'm not even a political thinker. Straight and simple, I'm a mathematician who has been thrust into this job of being at the helm of this huge university, which is like a microcosm of India. And I have to share some views, and I trust you may not find them entirely uninteresting. I would like to brief this audience a little bit with India's history. And when I speak of history, you'll have to believe me, this is history spreading over millennia. So I speak of times that go back from today, more than 5,000 years ago, and then allow us to see very briefly how India was in those days. Let me give you an illustration. There is a text that founds 
philosophy in India known as the Rig Veda. This text, by the most conservative estimates, is more than 5,000 years old and had permeated the length and breadth of what we call India today and more in unadulterated fashion. So the actual verses, the stanzas, the meaning, the interpretations were very clear and had not been diluted nor altered with such uniformity. Now you cannot do that, say 5,000 years ago or more, unless you had some means of getting people educated. This text allows us to learn many things. We infer many things. The opening stanza of the text also tells you the liberalness, the liberal thinking that existed in India from those times. The opening stanza says, let noble ideas come from every direction. It was open. Let things come to us. There is evidence now emerging that the Indus civilization, which is about that much old, that civilization is predated by this text. But the Indus civilization, as evidence is now emerging, is directly a descendant of that philosophy and that culture, the Vedic culture. And it was extraordinarily sophisticated. Imagine 5,000 plus years ago, older than other existing civilizations, they had, it was a city culture, an urban culture. There were houses, streets, all paved with baked clay bricks to perfect geometrical requirements. There were many other things. Metallurgy was extremely advanced, as archaeology now tells us, so on and so forth. That gives you an idea of the extent of how India was in terms of science and technology. I have accounts of historians, not just from India, but from other countries of the world, historians of science telling us amazing things. Plastic surgery existed in India some hundred years before Christ. There are deep accounts describing many things, including using metallurgy to construct the most sophisticated of instruments for plastic surgery. There is a mathematical device made famous in the 17th century by the French mathematician who is credited with its discovery called Pascal's Triangle, named after Blaise Pascal. It was discovered in India 500 years before Christ through Sanskrit poetry. The point I'm trying to make is that the Indian tradition of knowledge was not created through silos. It was transdisciplinary and it was deeply connected with the needs of society. So you have Sanskrit poets perfectly familiar with mathematics and using that to create this triangle for real practical purposes. I have read the writings of Voltaire and other historians of science and mathematics up until just few years ago when a distinguished historian of mathematics by the name of Kim Plofker writes on the same matters that the calculus was discovered in India 600 years before Newton for precisely the same reasons that Newton was led to discover the calculus planetary motion. In the 12th century, early 12th century, there was a mathematician by the name of Bhaskaracharya who discovered the derivative while studying the motion of planets, and he gives the derivative a term in Sanskrit, which literally translated into English, calls it instantaneous velocity. That is the exact same term that Isaac Newton gives, but so many hundreds of years later. I have read accounts of Harvard professors and professors of history from Portugal who tell us that at that point in time when Newton deposes before the British Parliament, that at this point in time, science knows no means of determining position at sea, latitude, longitude. At that point in time, Indian ships, merchant ships, 
using nautical tables that came out of the use of the calculus and such things from our universities, also had an instrument called the Rapalagai, which allowed them to determine latitude, longitude at sea. And Indian merchant ships used to travel well beyond Africa regularly. The European explorer Vasco da Gama is credited with having discovered the sea route to India. What historians now tell us, and from different lands, not just Indian historians, that Vasco da Gama engaged the services of an Indian navigator just when he touched Africa. Because Indian ships were readily available all along that route. In fact, the first navigator somehow, for some reason, had some premonition and didn't want Vasco da Gama to go to India. So he took him round a little bit in circles and then Vasco da Gama caught on and had him thrown overboard. And he engaged the services of another navigator from India who then took him to India. And he used that instrument, the Rapalagai. The point I'm trying to make is this, that the Indian tradition of science and technology empowered Indian society. These merchant ships used to travel faster, more accurately than their European counterparts. And therefore, they brought wealth to India in better ways. They were better built from our shipyards. But somewhere, this Indian tradition began to suffer. I can cite two or three quick reasons, and then I'll come to what I really want to say. India suffered a series of invasions from up north. And one of the telling after effects of those invasions was decline in the generation of knowledge for, the use, for use in society. Indian universities, which had extensive libraries, and these universities, as I told you, dated back to well before Christ, were actually demolished and the libraries were completely burnt. And I can trace the decline of these systems in India from that time onwards. And then the British came and ruled India. And they demoralized us and also subverted our own systems of knowledge significantly. So much so that there came a point in time when many Indians, having been educated through the British system, began to look down upon Indian systems of knowledge and their uses. Let's now move to the 20th century before I tell you what India is doing now. I grew up in India in a small town in the 60s. And this was less than 20 years after independence. So we were a young nation. And there were many things I remember from that time. I remember each year at different times of the year, we had to get ourselves inoculated against all kinds of infectious diseases. Smallpox, cholera, typhoid, polio, and we used to consistently hear of epidemics in one part of India or the other related to one or other outbreaks of these diseases. And I remember that very well. In fact, I had a sibling, younger to my brother who is seated here but older than me, who died because of being afflicted with polio. It wasn't just a matter of health. I remember so well that in those days, India had enormous food shortages. There used to be droughts and famines in different parts of India and thousands of people would die. Food used to be rationed. You would only allow a certain amount of sugar or grain or rice and stuff like that. It was difficult to procure enough food unless you were willing to pay in the black market. Everybody had to carry a ration card and that's how you were allotted your rationing. And there came a point in time when it felt like India would be deeply affected with food shortages and it would collapse 
when India appealed to the United States that came to India's aid in the 60s under the so-called PL-480 scheme when it shipped huge quantities of wheat to India. It's a different matter that that wheat was really meant for animal consumption, but in India it was a matter of survival. You needed whatever you could lay your hands on. I also remember I had barely begun school when in 1962, China attacked India. Till today, India has not really overcome the damage it did to our collective psyche. At that point, in 1962, even as a small boy, I remember how alarmed, how demoralized my country was. That was the only time I can remember when I heard our then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru deliver an address on radio. I still remember how pained his voice was, how anguished he was. China overran all Indian border outposts. It overran and seized huge parts of Indian territory. It isn't that our soldiers were not equal to them in courage. They stood their ground, but they were annihilated to a man. Why was that? We had some very primitive weaponry, almost no ammunition. There were no roads to give them supplies in a continuous fashion. And our Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru at that point in time wrote a letter to President Kennedy. Now you must look at the background. Nehru used to forever lecture to Kennedy and to the US on its foreign policy, particularly related to Vietnam and why it shouldn't interfere in the affairs of other nations. And he created a block of nations known as the non-aligned movement. They would refuse to align with either the communist bloc or the American Western bloc. The same Nehru, when China overran us in those large parts of North India, up in the border regions, writes to Kennedy, abject plea, asking not just for guns, asking for clothing, asking for ammunition, asking for air support, so that they could at least halt the Chinese. You can imagine how damaging it is, even if I as a child could register all those things at that point in time. I also remember many other things, and I'm talking of the 60s and the early 70s. I remember almost no one in that small town had a telephone connection. If you ever needed a phone, you had to hunt a home that would have a phone. And of course, it would also be a moot point as to whom would you converse with because you then had to find someone else who had a phone to call up. So you used phones really to deal with government agencies like the railways or doctors or something like that. It was impossible to get a telephone connection. These were rationed, you know, given selectively. There weren't enough phones. Communications were difficult in other means also. I lived in the town called Baroda, which is in the state of Gujarat, where, from where our current prime minister comes. The capital of Gujarat is a city called Ahmedabad. It was about 80 kilometers away from Baroda. 80 kilometers, which is really nothing. It used to take us more than three hours to drive from Baroda to Ahmedabad. And the road was in fairly bad condition, potholes. I still remember those potholes. But it isn't just about road connections. This was typical of India. Gujarat was a better off state. So you can imagine what it was like in other states of India. It isn't just telephones, it isn't just roads. There was a fairly extensive rail network in India. Trains traveled long distances in India or connected you with other trains that took you further. But try getting a rail reservation. And I remember well into the 70s, if I had to, for instance, even travel from Delhi to Bombay by train, and there weren't enough flights in those days. 
you had to stand in a queue for a particular train at a window, and the queue would always be enormous. And by the time your turn came, you would learn and be disappointed that there were no seats available, but there were other trains for which you had to stand in different queues at different windows. And it was an extremely frustrating experience. I also remember in the 60s, and in those days particularly, the skies in India used to be very clear. There wasn't much pollution. At night, you could see the Milky Way so clearly, and you could see satellites moving across the skies at night. And as a child, and my, my other playmates would all refer to every single satellite as the Sputnik. It was the Sputnik era. Much later, I realized there were many Sputniks, and there were American satellites too. And we used to just look at them, forlornly maybe, and there lurked this, this slight feeling of uneasiness, a little bit of disappointment, that we were just observers of this whole thing. Contrast this with India's past. And remember this, my father's generation, that sort of straddled pre and post independence and did much for the country, people like my father, who were students, fought for India's independence and were also extremely well-educated and rooted in India's culture. They were aware of India's traditions. And you can imagine what they must have felt when we, who were far more energetic and optimistic about the future, were also demoralized in so many ways. I remember when in the 70s, in one of the southern states of India, which has a huge coastline, a major cyclone struck the entire coastal belt, and India was caught unawares. There was no forewarning. Thousands and thousands of people died. Village after village was completely flooded and destroyed. And it took a long time to rehabilitate and rebuild. It was a huge coastline. And so you can see, here is a nation struggling to come to terms with realities in different sectors of society, in different ways challenging the growth of the nation. But there was one thing that India stayed with throughout. It never forgot to ensure, no matter how good or bad, it never forgot to ensure that there were reasonable educational institutions available and more were being created, particularly in the realm of science and technology. Right through the 60s and 70s, one by one, little by little, because we were short of money, India laid emphasis, it built the IITs, for instance, spread across different parts of India. Five IITs were built in a span, very short span of time. It also built other universities, no matter how modest, it built agricultural universities as well that began to lay emphasis on agriculture. And suddenly, when I look back now, and I was dimly aware even in the 90s, that you could tell things were changing, that science and technology was beginning to have an impact. And I'll tell you how. By the 90s, India had begun to become self-sufficient in food. It could generate enough rice and wheat and other food grains for its needs. And this was a direct impact of its agricultural institutions and universities, a direct impact. What is the situation now in the realm of agriculture? Since then, we have come a long way. My own university has some of the finest molecular biologists and geneticists who publish in the best journals of the world and come up with state-of-the-art applications of their knowledge. This year, India has had the largest wheat grain production in its recorded history. It doesn't know where to store the wheat. And this is when large tracts of Indian land have been taken away for urban growth 
or for special economic zones which have nothing to do with agriculture. In spite of the shrinking land of agriculture, wheat grain production is the recorded, largest in its recorded history. This year, India is the largest exporter of rice in the world. As I said, just contrast this with the fact that land for agricultural uses has begun to shrink rapidly, and yet this is where we have reached. But it isn't just agriculture. I could notice the seeds of change in many other areas. In the 70s, in 1977, India eradicated smallpox. That was a huge achievement. And I remember that year, there was an outbreak of smallpox in England. I still remember that. It was a strange contrast. Last year, India became free of polio. And remember, this is a huge achievement given our size, given our diversity. There has been no recorded case of polio in India for more than one year. And remember, in Bangladesh and Pakistan, we still have polio and these are on our borders and there is huge movement. Yet we have been able to control that. And I could see the seeds because in the realm of health too, India's education, emphasis on education was strong. In 1994, one of our cities on the western side, on the coast, was struck by the plague. It came back to India after many decades. It was shameful, embarrassing. But the point I noted even then was within one week, not only had they contained the plague so that it did not go beyond the city, they eradicated it. It was eradicated within a week. It speaks volumes of India's inherent strength in the health sciences that they could identify and figure out ways and means to eradicate and control it both. So you can see that in the realm of health, in the realm of agriculture, India made huge progress. And all because of its emphasis on science and technology and health sciences and education in these realms, even though we were always in those days short of funding. But it isn't just that. Some time back, I looked at a visual image of the road between Baroda, the town where I grew up, and the capital of that state, Ahmedabad, that 80 kilometer stretch. It is a sight to behold. Beautiful dual carriageways, each carriageway having many lanes, well laid out, pleasing to the eye, and you can complete the journey in one hour or less flat, with no hindrances. You can travel from Delhi to Agra, which used to take more than three hours and there were many hazards on the road, now in less than one hour because there is an expressway of the same caliber. But more importantly, in this century, in 2003, the then Prime Minister of India announced an ambitious plan to connect the major metros of India through these special highways, national highways. When they announced the plan, I thought, where will they get the money from? And where will they get the technology from? But in no time were the highways put in place and they changed India's economy. How did they change the economy? Let me tell you, when the rest of the world was down on its knees, when there was 0% growth or negative in the Western world, including the United States. And I remember at that point in time, talking to the Brazilian president who was visiting India. And I asked her what was her economy like, and she said, we are doing all right, we grew at 2%. At that point in time, India refused to go below 5%. There's something happening there. These highways transformed the economy. Goods, services were transferred and moved in no time. And now there is a much larger network of roads spanning the length and breadth of the country and we found the money for that through our own resources. What about the telephone system? Today, almost any person in any village, and there are thousands and thousands of villages. Remember, our population is 1.2 billion and largely residing in villages. 
Forget the cities, I'm talking of villages, almost every person has a personal cell phone. And they use it to great advantage. Farmers receive inputs related to their agriculture, also to marketing, where they should take their produce on a daily basis on the new roads that have been built. And because India's own indigenous motor car industry is booming, farmers have access to loans by which they buy or hire these vehicles and then they transfer and transmit these goods. It has changed our economy. Remember I told you the realm of rail reservation, how we had to stand in queues. Today, while I'm talking to you, I can reach for my cell phone attached to my hip here on this holster and I can book a rail ticket from any city of India to any other city by just punching a few buttons and print it through this computer and a printer here without ever having to waste half a minute in any queue. That's the change that has come about. And I want you to think about that. These are huge changes that have happened, huge changes. Sometime back, just a few months ago, warnings came through our own government agencies and through other European and American agencies that another coastal state of India was going to be struck by a super cyclone called Phalin. And it was a super cyclone. The cyclone hit this coastal belt. Guess how many lives were lost? Less than 10. There were villages after villages that were affected. You cannot prevent that. That's the fury of nature. But less than 10 lives were lost. Also, there was a huge dam there called the Hirakud Dam. And there was a challenge for Indian scientists because they had to empty the reservoir. because There would be huge amounts of rain coming in to flood the dam. And they were worried, if you empty more than you should, then you will not have enough for power generation and agriculture after the cyclone goes. And if you don't empty enough, the dam could burst. And they emptied a certain amount, and when the cyclone left, there was a foot of space left at the top. That was just about the optimal amount that you could ask for. Why did this happen? Why were so few lives lost? Why did this happen? Why could they realize how much to put? The first signs of this cyclone were based on an IIT professor's model, which he was doing in con the context of something else. He was not a weather scientist. But he immediately alerted through the National Knowledge Network. This is a multi-billion dollar internet highway that the government of India has created to connect all institutions in India of scientific research and teaching. It is an unlimited bandwidth network, and he put it through that to other institutions, and the Indian Meteorological Department picked the data up immediately, and it was put out on the web everywhere. There were models from the United States, there were models from Europe, mathematical models, and there was a model that the Indian Meteorological Department put up. I sit on the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Union Cabinet of the Government of India, so I'm privy to this information. The Indian model was far more accurate. They predicted exactly at what time, with what velocity, the cyclone will hit the land. They also predicted how much rain, therefore they could empty the reservoir of that much water. The models are all available for a comparative study, which is what the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Cabinet did. And so I give you verified information. That is the prowess, and that is why less than 10 lives were lost. And so once again, I just put forward this thesis, this point that the prowess of science and technology has begun to affect India in many positive ways, in extremely positive ways. Where are we in the realm of space? As I speak before you, and my distinguished colleague, Dr. Nair is here from the Indian Space Research Organization, India is one amongst three countries in the world that have the technological capability and the financial 
to put a man on the moon and to put a man on Mars. And India's mission to the moon will be launched, man mission will be launched soon and we are going to put up a station there. Some months ago, we sent our mission to Mars. It is a technological marvel. It will reach Mars in a few months. It has done exceedingly well already. It is technologically as adept as the US mission from whom we have learned so much. What's the difference? And I have the greatest of respect for the United States in a personal capacity and for other reasons, because I have benefited immensely. I wouldn't be half the mathematician I am if I hadn't been connected with the mathematics of the US. But in this realm of the mission to Mars, technologically comparable, but the US mission costs, if I'm not mistaken, more than $300 million, probably 400. The Indian mission costs $74 million. It's cheaper than the cheapest Boeing aircraft. There's something happening there. There's something happening. Our design of these rocket with rockets which propel are getting better and better. And we will use the latest rockets with the latest technology indigenously designed to send our manned mission to moon and then to Mars. But the story doesn't end there. Today, India manufactures its own nuclear submarines and its own nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. And what about this business of defending Indian territory? Once again, because I'm privy to information, and this is nothing secret or privileged, but hasn't maybe been publicized enough in many circles, India has a missile defense system called the BrahMos. And its technological capability is superior to any existing missile defense system in any part of the world. I can give you with full assurance this knowledge. That's the state we have. God forbid if a neighboring state decides to launch a missile against us, we have the capability to put that missile down on their territory before it reaches our shores. That is the extent to which India has developed. So ladies and gentlemen, the point I wanted to make was why and how did we do that? Because one, I feel somewhere it's in our genes, given our traditions, our heritage. Two, there's something else that's happened right through these decades that I spoke about, government had the sagacity, the wisdom, no matter how many in other ways it may have faltered, it managed to stay the course in the realm of science and technology education, kept the basics going. And there's a new thing that's happening. You must also not forget that Indian democracy is extremely strong. In the most recently concluded elections, 750 million people voted. Each one of those votes was cast through an electronic ballot. Made in India, completely foolproof, not a single complaint has been received and five such elections have been conducted over a period of 20 years. And 750 million people voted and the results were out in 12 hours. Exactly 12 hours, the results were out when the counting started. And because of that, we become a stronger democracy. And two things I want to say, and I will end then. One, I remember in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, when these elections were held, there would always be reports of widespread rigging of votings fake ballots being cast by stamping of papers. The last three elections, it has diminished like anything. This election, we had almost no report of any kind of malpractice connected with the elections. That's the stage to which India has begun to pass. And more importantly, this democracy has allowed a huge segment of our young population that Fitz referred to 
to have access to the portals of higher education. My own university and others in India are being flooded with a young generation, young minds, who had not ever had in the past, in their generations past, any opportunity or access to higher education. They have a hunger for knowledge, a commitment to pursue knowledge, particularly in the sciences. And I think India has begun to understand that they must seize the moment. And by all accounts, all these trends, all these factors that are enunciated before you, I believe we're doing the right thing. And so my point is science and technology, education in these areas play a huge role in empowering a nation. That is what I wish to say to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Denise. That was uh, excellent. You gave us a, a great appreciation of what is uh, happening in India today. Uh, that uh, concludes our program uh, for today. Uh, and I think we had an excellent ending to it. I appreciate that. So uh, we're going to start again tomorrow morning and uh, look forward to seeing all your happy faces then and uh, hearing uh, the discussion groups uh, report on their recommendations, and I'm look, looking forward to that. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you've enjoyed the day. I hope you've enjoyed the dinner, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>